you've created, produced, directed, written so many shows, <laughs> including Grizzly Adams, Burke's Law, Matt Houston, the Star Trek shows, Charm, 90210. But I'm going to start with Paradise because it's my all-time favorite show. So you were the supervising producer on the show, along with writing and directing some episodes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what a supervising producer entails? I was kind of the head writer. The show was created by David Jacobs, who had created Knott's Landing in Dallas. He wrote and directed the pilot of the show, and then uh, the show sold. And so once a show sells, you need a writing staff to write the episodes every week. So David was the executive producer and, and the big boss. And then I was the head of the of the writers. I was the, the head writer. And then beneath me, there were other writers. And then we had freelance writers who would come in. And we would all pitch ideas and break down the stories and then turn the final scripts into David, who would make final changes. So you hopefully can answer a lot of my questions. Then. <laughs> the first one I've always wondered about the third season. Um, a paradise, which of course it was held for mid season. And that meant that Sigrid was only in the available to play Amelia for the first eight episodes. And at the end of the eighth episode, Birthright, Amelia leaves town and we never see her again. If paradise had started its third season in the fall, would the rest of the season played out differently? And would Amelia have returned in the very next episode? No, because uh, we still started shooting at the same time. Even oh, okay. Did not air till mid season. She had the conflict, and um, I don't remember all the details about it, but uh, uh, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have changed things. I, I'm not sure how she was able to get another job to leave because the actors were under contract. I don't remember that, but uh, the show wasn't the same without her. No, sure. <laughs> definitely. So I guess in this one's after the sh um, shortened third season. Were there any plans already in place for what would happen for the fourth season? And specifically, would Amelia, Amelia have returned? And what were the thoughts with dealing with Sigrid's real-life pregnancy? Um, yes, she definitely would have come back. We probably would have written in that they got together and she got pregnant. I mean, uh, that's sort of the common way. Or you try to shoot around it. But that's yeah. on that this kind of family show and the of holding off of their relationship. I think it would have been nice to have them become a couple and, and have a baby. Um, you know, the show was always on, on the edge of getting canceled. It was barely picked up from season one to season two. And then from season two to season three, that's when they, to, to get us picked up, they made us change the title from Paradise to Guns of Paradise. Yeah, I was going to ask um, you about that. <laughs> it was it was a a, a a condition of the pickup because the network was trying to improve the ratings. It was a funny show. In the um, big cities, it had very bad ratings. You know, in those days, you would have overnight ratings and then national ratings. And the overnight ratings were the 20 big cities. And then the national ratings were everybody else. And generally, in the overnight ratings, we would have like a 12 share but then when the rest of the country was averaged in, we'd be up to like a 20 share because we were such a big hit in the hinterland, you know, in, in the world between New York and L.A. Um, but the network really wanted those big city numbers. So the quality of the show helped us continue to get picked up year after year. It was a great show with a wonderful cast. But season three, when they changed the title and they gave us a bad time slot and we didn't come on to midseason, it sort of kills the show off and that's what they did the show died mm -hmm. i mean and the whole like you said the tone of it kind of changed and they changed the storylines to be more like you know ethan and dakota and <laughs> and they brought in a young sexy guy to to play with lee and that you know the, the, all those things that the networks do that never work right sell the actors who are on the show and lead to cancellation yeah yeah i was going to ask you how you felt about dakota and it just seemed like that became two different shows there was that lead story with them two and then every once in a while you'd have Amelia and the children and John Taylor have a storyline <laughs> yeah it was unfortunate it's not the fault of the actor you know he, he was a very nice guy oh but yeah yeah it was just the what the network made you do you know I often talk about the networks as temporary people making permanent decisions because you know the year after that the, the president of the network was gone. There was somebody else in there making a completely different decision. So that's just what happens. Yeah. 
So um, you wrote or co-wrote at least 11 episodes of Paradise. Um, what was the development process for writing an episode? Um, it was different then than it is now. Now you have big writer's rooms where you have 10 or 11 writers on each show. You all sit in a room and they break down the story. They come up with the idea for the story. They break it down, act one, act two, act three, act four. And, um, and then one of them is assigned to write it. And then the executive producer will do a final polish and go through it. In those days, the writing staff was only four people. And we would bring in uh, freelance writers to work with us. And so people would come in and pitch ideas to us. And if we liked the idea, we would then develop it with them, break it down much like the writer's room and, and then get the script written. And then David would take a final pass at it. So we also, because we were on staff and knew the show best, we would write most of the scripts. Um, Joel Fagenbaum, who was, uh, I met on that show and has become a lifelong friend, he had worked with David on Knott's Landing. He was a writer on the show, and he and I started writing together a lot, and we really got along, and we wrote together on two other shows after that, three other shows after that. So he became a really good friend, and he's a wonderful writer. Um, and that's how we wrote a lot of the shows. And I, I loved uh, working on that show. That was you know, because you were always, we were telling allegories, we were telling, you know, stories set in the, in the, uh, at the turn of the century, but that really were relevant now. And we also often went back to classic Hollywood Westerns and would look at them and then try to do our version of that story. Like we did one about the, uh, the three babies, uh, the, the, the three, that when the, the three of them find a baby in the, in the, in the wilderness is based mm -hmm. on a Western story. And yeah. a number of them we did like that, which was great fun. I was going to ask how you the came three up Godfathers. with the, the three Godfathers. That was I was going to ask how you came up with um, ideas for the show. Yeah, a lot of it came from older westerns, and then you just kick around different ideas. Like I, the idea when uh, Amelia was shot, we were just pitching ideas, and it just occurred to me, what if he shoots her? Mm -hmm. and, That's a great uh, episode. Great episode, and uh, you know that that had a lot to do with you know violence and gun control and you know the right and wrong and a, a lot of different elements um so yeah yeah i we we had a, and then there was a, one of my favorites i directed was the one with the preacher and my wife rebecca was in that she played yeah. um scotty's wife right and that was fun to work with her on that yes um how was it decided which characters would be featured in each episode We had a, a, a rotating bunch of, of the townsfolk who we always liked, and each one just sort of, as time went on, developed their own complicated backstory, which would lead to episode ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and we would just pitch ideas around and, and land on one, but there was no set rule about, we're going to do the story about Scotty, we're going to do a story about this character. It just sort of evolved generically as we were talking. Mm -hmm. Um, was it hard to remember what happened in previous episodes to keep the continuality? Uh, yes and no. Uh, probably not, but we always could look back at the scripts and remember or watch the episodes. Right. Uh, it, it really became, it, you know, it's like an evolving novel. So as the stories go on, relationships change, people come and go. And it's that's the fun of doing episodic television like that. It's, it's all of these people become real to you, three-dimensional to you. And that town existed it was on the Disney ranch. It's not there anymore. But uh, so we would go there. It was our home for three years. And uh, uh, it really became like a living, breathing place to us. Did you have to do a lot of research when writing it to keep it historically accurate? I did in the beginning, the first season, more than after that, um, because it was an interesting time in history, uh, right around the turn of the century. And, you know, Western towns were sort of dying out and we wanted to find out where technology was and what was going on. So there was some of that involved. Yeah, I was thinking especially about the episode Burial Ground, where um, they did with Black Cloud, came back for his ancestral home. Right. Yeah, okay. things like that we need to research to get right. Um, do you have a favorite episode of Paradise or one that you were particularly proud of? I loved the the season, the end of season one when her husband, ex-husband comes back. That was really fun. And I love the finale, which I directed as well, which which was really wonderful. And the one I mentioned with the preacher, I, I guess my favorite ones were the ones I directed. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm was, biased. was there a favorite type of episode or storyline that you'd like to write? I like the ones that had humor in them. 
and also mm -hmm. a little heartache. Right. So when you could blend the both, it was wonderful. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Long Lost Lawson. Long right. Lost <laughs> Interesting title to say. Um, it's one of the ones you wrote and directed. And did you have any backstory on that and thought how they met or how their relationship was? Well, once we decided that, you know, I think in the backstory she had an ex-husband, but we never really talked about him. So then we just sort of started coming up with what would be fun for this character and that he was a con man and charlatan and all this stuff, just sort of made for an interesting character to write. And so that's what we did. Yeah. And um, did you have any backstory that you used for writing any other characters or when you wrote an episode, did you think of a backstory? Yeah, we would always come up with who this character was and what the backstory of them was. And usually by mining that territory, we would find things to put into the story. Um, you wrote, like you say, Long Lost Loss, and you wrote Season 2 and Dirt Dust on the Wind. And on each of those episodes, you had a major character leave, Amelia in the first one, and then Ethan and the children in the second one. But then they always came back. They returned at the end. Yes. So since at the time you were writing them, you weren't certain if the show would be picked up for the next season. Did you intentionally try to give some closure to the show while still leaving it open for the next season? It was in our minds that, yes, uh, this might be the end. And so let's leave it with a feeling that of some sense of closure. So definitely uh, that was something that we, we kept in mind in both the end of the first season and of the second season. Yeah. Um, was the second to last episode of the third season, 24 Hours, intended to be the season finale? It was the one where in the day of a life of Ethan as a marshal. And I have to say, I love the scene in that episode where Ethan and John Taylor are talking and um, Ethan says he misses Amelia and John Taylor says she'll be back. Uh, I, I don't believe it was the intended to be the season finale. I think we, oh. we aired them in order. In fact, we were always backed up having to shoot. So it, it was always going to be the penultimate episode. Okay. Because the last episode was the one unfinished business where you had like a lot of clips. Um, the guy came back to kill Ethan and you had a lot of clips for the third season, season ender. I actually don't remember that that that, that well. So I don't, oh, I can't. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember that we had a lot. Of, how many clips was it? How much of a flashback was it? It was like a, a bunch of flashbacks just quite a few of um, things that, because it, it went back to the first episode where the guy was there to kill Ethan, but he found out he hadn't, and that was Unfinished Business, which was the third season gotcha. ender. Yeah. Gotcha. I always wonder why there was no clips of Amelia, but you did. <laughs> and I, I'm sure that uh, we knew that we weren't gonna be coming back, so that's why it was sort of tried to complete the circle. Yeah. Um, what's your process for directing an episode? When I read a script, and I've directed so many episodes that I haven't written. I've directed both, ones I've written, one I haven't written. But let's talk about when I, ones I haven't written. As I read it and study it, I can visualize it. I see it in my head. And so I write down you know, what the set looks like, and I sort of block where the actors will be, and I decide what shots I would like well before I ever get to the set. And then when I'm on the set... Uh, with the actors, if they have other ideas, we can incorporate those into what I'm thinking. Or I'll change my plans accordingly. But by all my preparation, I can move very quickly. But I, I, because I have the ability to read something and visualize it and see it, I see the show, I see the movie in my head. It, it makes directing for me uh, quite rewarding and uh, something I really love. Um, how much time did you have for rehearsal when you did an episode or directed it? Well, generally on a television show, the first rehearsal is called the blocking. You, you get to set, and in a 12-hour day, I would say nine hours of that 12 hours is spent lighting. So what you want to do is block the scene with very, with very it's a rehearsal, but it's not a, a, an intense rehearsal. You block the scene, decide where the actors are going to be, and they put down the marks so that they know how to light it. Then the actors leave, and they usually go to hair and makeup and wardrobe. And then they'll come back and I'll chat with them a little bit. And then when the lighting is done, we go to the set. And that's when you do the first rehearsal. And it's usually just one or two times you hold, they hold back their emotions, excuse me, until you're shooting. And then you start shooting and hopefully you can get it in one, two or three takes. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes, there... if it's, sometimes if it's a particularly difficult scene, I'll rehearse it a day or two before that, that scene with the actors. 
to get everybody's opinion and to really work it out. Um, every actor is a different process. And so respecting that process, I know what they need. Mm -hmm. Do you have, were there any unique aspects of directing Paradise? The fact that it was a Western, uh -huh. because for example, if you have a scene and the stagecoach drives through town, it's unlike a car where you can just back it up and do it again. You got to stop, turn it around, go back, reset everything. And all of the seat, street scenes had a lot of people all doing a lot of action. So it, it was a complicated show to do because it was period uh, and because of the horses and the, all of the props that are necessary. So, um, and the, you know, you had gunfights on horseback and you had fist fights and there was a lot of things that went into it. So it was a complicated show to do, but it was always, you know, doing a Western is just so much fun. I was going to ask you with all the horses and the horseback riding and everything, how much of that did you have to use stunt people for? A lot. Yeah. So there were a lot of stunt people. But I don't know if you, if you remember in season two, Lee was hurt, mm -hmm. his, which is why he started wearing the patch for that part of the year. His horse, and it wasn't even a, a dangerous thing, but his horse just reared his head back and got him in the eye. And, uh, but he was a great horseman. Lee's a great horseman. So he did most of his own riding. But on some of the wider shots or more complicated shots, we would double them. And right. there was a lot of stunt guys as the bad guys. Stunt guys driving the four up and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I guess insurance made you do some of that too. And, and common sense. You don't want to hurt your actors. Right, right. And then we had a lot of people jumping through windows and getting you know, <laughs> punched here and there and things like that. You would use stunt people. What about the episode, I, I don't recall the name, but the horse, Lee's riding the horse and it goes through the window. Yes, that was a stunt double. That was Jimmy Nickerson, who was our stunt coordinator, and he doubled Lee. Mm -hmm. And yes, that was uh, that was fun. I mean, that was really a cool scene to watch. That was Yeah, it was fun to that. shoot, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you enjoy filming inside on a, a soundstage or outside at the Disney Ranch? I liked both. I prefer when possible to shoot on a soundstage because I have total control over the set. I can put the lights where I want them and move the actors where I want. I can take walls down, put walls up, you know, really make it easy for the camera to tell the story. And a good art director will give you a great set so you won't really know that you're in a set. Though when you're outside, you get a, a great sense of reality and, and there's a lot that you can you can add to a picture. So, you know, I like doing both, but when I can shoot an interior, on stage, I much prefer it. Mm -hmm. um, what was the personality of the Paradise set? It was wonderful. It was a, you know, we thought it was a family show. People would bring their kids and, and wives all the time. Really a fun, great place to be. Everybody, and every year we had a wrap party where everybody brought their whole family. It was a, a, a barbecue a, a, on a Saturday. Everybody brought their kids. And it was just, you know, a, a warm, wonderful experience that we all enjoyed both shooting it and then as as a family mm -hmm. um do you keep in touch with any of the actors from paradise i can't but occasionally bump into some i talked to lee not too long ago but not a lot I, i'm in touch with more of the star trek people than i am with the paradise people but there were a lot more star trek people right <laughs> um we also I kind of we touched on this, but what input did you have in the decision to change the title from Paradise to Guns of Paradise and the changes in the story focus of the third season? Were you like uh, none? It was a network mandate. Yeah. They said if you want to get picked up, your title's gonna be Guns of Paradise, and we're gonna add a young guy to the cast. Yeah. <laughs> we got to um, cast him. So we we you know, we cast a lot of actors and then the network had approval. So we we were able to cast who we wanted, but it was not a choice. Right. Um, if you had to do it over again, is there anything about Paradise that you would change or do differently? Well, I wouldn't have brought that character into season three. I wouldn't have changed right. the title. And I would have kept it on the year in the air four more years. Oh, yeah. That would have been cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first season of Paradise is available on DVD. Do you have any input on the delay in the putting the second and third seasons on of the show on DVD? No, I was thrilled to see the first year. I have it. I have a copy of it. But um, I think it was really, they were going to see if it sold enough to do seasons two or season three, and I guess not. Um, right. I think it's been on, on TV a few times. I'm not quite sure where, but I'm, some of these channels that run, run the old reruns. But it you know, was on you, 
It was on, it was on Get TV. Like um, it's not on there anymore, but it was on there like two or two years or so ago for a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. You never quite know when these things turn up. Um, I would love to get DVDs of the others. Uh, I'd like to go back. I haven't watched the first season in a long time. I'd like to go back and look at a couple of those episodes again, just for fun. Yeah, I have the first season DVD too, and I'd love to get the second and third seasons. <laughs> yeah, me too. I don't have copies of those. Oh, wow. You know, the uh, the technology back then was so different than now. Now it's uh -huh. so easy to get DVDs or digital downloads, but back then there was, it wasn't so easy. Yeah, I actually would record it on a VCR back then. Yeah. Yeah. And I still have those, but that's not like a DVD quality, you know. No. Um, having worked with Lee Horsley on Matt Houston, did you and David Jacobs have him in mind for Ethan Court on Paradise and Lieutenant Ben Carroll on Bodies of Evidence? Um, I worked on Matt Houston. David wasn't a part of that. And then he and I had the same agent. So when he oh. sold Paradise uh, with Lee, it, it made sense to David that we met and talked. And since I had a relationship with Lee from Parrot from Matt Houston for three seasons and Lee and I got along great, it made sense for me to come along and work on Paradise with David. And then David and I partnered up and created Bodies of Evidence. And we always had Lee Horsley in mind for that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's a funny story on Bodies of Evidence. Um, I often say that the reason George Clooney is a big star is because of Les Moonves. When we went to Warner Brothers, uh, Laura Mar we were making our show for Laura, Laura Mar but then it was Paradise, but it was bought by Warner Brothers. We moved to the uh, Warner Brothers lot for the last season. Les Moonves was president of Warner Brothers. When we sold Bodies of Evidence, uh, it just had Lee Horsley. It did not have George Clooney in it. And Les Moonves was convinced that George was going to be a star. At this point, George had been in like 16 failed pilots, but Les kept putting him in stuff. He put him in our show. He was, George was great. He was a fantastic addition. Loved working with him. Uh, we did 16 episodes over two seasons, but the show failed. Then uh, Les Moonves put George into uh, Sisters as a recurring role. Still nothing. And then he finally put him into ER, and George finally became the big star, and then you, the rest is history. But it was, in my opinion, Les Moonves' conviction that George was going to be a big star that led to George's opportunities to finally become that big star. Yeah, because if no one believes in you or keeps putting you in shows, the right one's not going to come along. <laughs> right, right. That's, and it, 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 he's, he's somebody I'm so happy became a big star because he's a, a wonderful, well-rounded person and filmmaker. He's just great. Um, you've been involved in Western, sci-fi, action, adventure. So is there a genre that you'd particularly like to create or write or direct or just watch yourself? I like them all. It's uh, the, the two that I love are Westerns and sci-fi. And I've done a lot of sci-fi in my career. And you sort of, well, as a kid, I remember reading sci-fi books when I was seven, eight years old. I've always been drawn to it. And I always, in, in my generation, you would be watching uh, um, Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson and Death Valley Days as a kid. And so for me, it was a thrill on, on Paradise when we got to bring in Hugh O'Brien and Gene Barry to play their roles from the past when they all teamed up with uh, Lee, beginning of season two, I think. Uh, yeah. For that, that yeah, great show. That was that was a thrill for me to uh, to bring back those old uh, legends who I'd worked with before, uh, both of them, and I worked with them since. Oh wow! Not, not in a long time, but after that. Right. Um, with the wide range of shows you've been involved in in various roles, which of these roles do you find the most challenging, and which the most rewarding? Um, I find directing the thing I was born for. I'm most comfortable on the set. I love doing it. Uh, I have a real gift for it, in my opinion. I just enjoy it. I feel I feel the happiest when I'm directing. I think writing is the biggest challenge because it's a blank page, and there's a lot of wonderful writers, and, and uh, writing is, is the hardest, but it's also very rewarding. Um, but interestingly, if I direct my own script, versus directing someone else's script. I have no, I have more sense of ownership over directing than I do over writing. Because when you write a script and someone else directs it, in my mind, you're sort of giving up a lot of the ownership because the director's the one who's on the set, designs the shots, says cut print, um, even though there is no director without a writer. Uh, I've always felt that the directing is the, is the, the more important of the collaborative, collaborative parts of it. Um, for me, it's also the most enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Um, do you 
find it difficult to direct shows such as Star Trek, which require a lot of special effects and green screens, or shows such in Paradise where there are animals, children, stunts? And does each show have its own special challenges? Each show has its own challenges. I love uh, sci-fi and green screens, and I've been there from the very beginning of the digital age, mostly through Star Trek and then Charmed and Supernatural and Smallville. So I've been very involved in the whole birth of the digital evolution and special effects and CGI and all of that, and how much more we can do now than we could before. Um, but it's challenging in a different way. Working with animals and kids is really challenging because you have no control over animals. They refuse to read the script. And then <laughs> kids are kids. So sometimes they're great. And other times they just you know, rambunctious and you can't get them to do what you want. So in a funny way, working with a green screen is easier because all the difficult stuff, the creation of the CGI is done later by experts who do that. I'm just shooting actors against green screen um, and trying to get them to act appropriately. But dealing with uh, animals and kids is much more difficult. <laughs> Um, you directed one of my favorite Star Trek Voyager episodes, which was the 37s, where um, they find Amelia Earhart and all the other people from 1937. And since this episode had elements of the future, plus look back at the past, do you prefer stories that look back in time? And do you or do you prefer the future or do you like tra time travel shows? I would love to do tra time travel shows. I haven't really done many of those. Um, 37s was a lot of fun to do. Uh, and, and a lot of it was just because of the, the difference between what was important in their past versus what the world is like now. The thing about Star Trek is it was all about hope and you know the, the, the curing of diseases and the end of poverty and the end of greed and you know having a, a balanced, wonderful Earth. And we're trying to spread that sort of around the universe. So a lot of things that were important, especially to the businessman, money-wise, had no meaning anymore. And uh, he, just being able to point those kinds of things out, I thought, is always important. So I do like to be able to deal with the past versus the present and things like that. Paradise, in a way, because it was allegorical, did the same thing. We would highlight issues then that are still important issues now. Mm -hmm. um, you were executive vice president of Spelling Television, and you worked on shows such as 90210, Melrose Place, Charmed. Um, among many others. So um, does working on those shows differ from working on science fiction, westerns, and action adventure? Definitely. It, you know, it's soap operas, basically, the 90210 and Melrose Place. Um, but they're soap operas in a sense that the audience is really invested in a good way in these characters. To the audience, these are real people. So you take them very seriously. The actors, in most cases, were fantastic. Uh, there was never an issue on 90210. Once Shannon Doherty left, that was the only time there was a kind of a bump early in the season, early in the series. Um, but that cast was great. Merrill's Place had no issues. That cast was great. Um, and they were fun to do, especially Merrill's, because it had such, you know, out there sort of plots and twists. Um, but they were both really fun to work on. They're completely different than the other kinds of shows, but very enjoyable. Um, going back to Paradise, I know you used like um, Ted Shackelford came on that was from Knott's Landing. And um, I think Nicholas Sheraton was on an episode. So did you try to get people from some of your other shows on as guest stars? Oh, yeah. Whenever we could get a guest star, uh, we would write a script. And if it seemed appropriate for a guest star, we would look for somebody. And because of David's doing uh, nine or two, excuse me, uh, uh, Knott's Landing, we were able to get those two. Um, at a better price than we would have otherwise, or wouldn't have been able to get them at all. Right. So yeah, that definitely helped. And those and Knott's Landing was still going while we were doing Paradise, so uh, yeah. it was it was great. Yeah, like Knott's Landing too. <laughs> um, do you have any like special memories from Paradise, or special things that funny stories that happened, or? <laughs> you know, at this point, the overall memory is just a really wonderful, sweet one. David Jacobs passed away about six months ago. Yes. And uh, we would see each other every so often. And, you know, he he created this show and it was so different than Dallas and Nuts Landing that uh, he just loved it. It was, it was probably his, his favorite show that he did. And I loved it because it involved the things I loved. It was an action adventure with the, the, the gunfights and him being a gunslinger. But it was also about kids and raising a family and and a lot of philosophy from um, um What's his name? Uh, John Taylor. 
Thank you so much. John Taylor, <laughs> uh, who died just after we finished season three, actually, the actor. Uh, so that, to me, it was the best of all storytelling. You had uh, uh, home stuff, you had action, you had humor, you had pathos, and it was a real family feeling. I've worked with a lot of the crew from that show on many other shows and actors on many other shows. You know, I, I like to, when I work with an actor and I like him, I try to bring it with me as many times as I can. So uh, that that show is, is, it was fantastic. And for years, uh, it was very hard for me to think of working on a show that I loved more. Yeah, I, I feel like that's one of, like I said, maybe my all time favorite, but definitely one of my all time favorite shows. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, you've also written three novels and a rubber ducky series of children's books. So yes. how did they come about? <laughs> well, the, uh, the novels, I always wanted to write novels. And then uh, I, in 2012 or so, I had time and I, I wrote the first novel. It's Hollywood thrillers, which I've always loved. It's three standalones. They're all different, different characters, but they're all set in Hollywood and, and Los Angeles. And it's, I loved doing it. It was really fun. Um, and then I had two grandchildren. I had two grandsons. And so I had, during the pandemic, started doing funny things with rubber ducks, putting them in all sorts of different uh, artwork, like famous artwork. I would insert a rubber duck into it. So rubber ducks became kind of a joke around me and the family. So when I had uh, the grandsons, I wanted to make some books for them. And I decided to use the rubber ducks. And so I did four rubber duck books for them. And uh, they're on Amazon. People can pick them up. They're really cute. But it was for my grandsons that I did it. Uh huh. Um, you also have I, on your website some amazing photography. Um, many of it's from, I guess, places you visited. And how did you get into photography? And do you have a favorite place to take photos or subjects to take photos of? Um, I've been taking photos my whole life. I remember there's a picture of me as a kid, about eight years old, with an old brownie around my neck. But I got serious. And being a director, I'm looking through a camera my you know for 50 years. But I got serious about photography in the early 2000s, and now uh, I'm retired and I travel a lot. And so wherever I go, I you know I, I go out of my way to take as many photos as I can and then post the great ones. And I travel a lot to places to get some pictures. I just came back from Antarctica, and that was fantastic. I loved being there. It's one of my favorite places. But Iceland is magnificent. And on the website, you can, it's jameslconway.com. On the website, you can, there's a link to the photos and you can see all the places I've been. And I'm headed to Norway and then Japan later this year. So I combine my love of travel with my ability to take photos and they complement each other really well. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're really, I, they were really nice. So, yeah, <laughs> I really like those. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to just talk about or? No, I, I appreciate your you're liking the show so much. It's not many people who still talk about Paradise, and that's a shame. I wish it was out there for more people to see. I think it was one of the great underappreciated shows in uh, TV history. 